Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Chris Quinn. I'm the youth pastor here at Portland Community Church, and we're just so glad you are here to join us this morning. Uh, we've been in this series called The Bible in Two Words, and it's about the book of Galatians. And so uh, we invite you to grab a Bible, whether it's on your smartphone or on you know, or a physical Bible that you have, or if you are a guest with us this morning and you do not have a Bible, there should be a brown hardcover back Bible in the seat in front of you and turn to page 1170. That's where we're going to be. And we are in Galatians chapter 4 verses 17 through 31. So I want to start this morning by telling you a story. Uh, many of you know that we take the kids to the youth to a place called Camp Tapawingo uh, every summer. And that is like my favorite place in the entire planet, okay? That place is near and dear to my heart. Um, but a little known fact that I really haven't shared with a whole lot of people is that my first time that I went, I almost went home and didn't want to come back, which was 14 years ago and I haven't ever left. And so <laughs> I'm so glad that I didn't do that. But let me tell you the story of what happened. So I gave my life to Christ in April of 2002. And there was this girl, doesn't, isn't it always a girl when it comes to teenage boys? There was this girl that I had known in middle school who I had a pretty big crush on. Like, and she liked me too, but you know, middle school, whatever. Okay, and so she, I heard she was gonna go to camp and I was like, oh yeah, I'm there. And like right after both of us had given our lives to Christ around the same time, we actually started studying the Bible together during our lunch, you know, during our school's lunch. And I was like, this girl's pretty. She likes me. She's studying the Bible with me. This is like, this is working out really well. And so we both go to camp. And before we go to camp, she says to me, she looks me in the face and she says, you and I are going to be attached at the hip throughout the entire week at camp. I promise you. And I was like, yes, awesome the entire week I get to spend with this girl. And not 24 hours into it, she broke her promise. And some cute guy got, caught her attention and she was following him around the whole time. And I remember, yeah, it was awful. So I, rem and I remember one free time, uh, you know, we get about a couple hours of free time every day. I went up to my cabin and for those, so for the kids, you know, the kids who go to camp, Upper Block House, so I was really committed to this moment. Upper Block House, and that's, which is way up on this hill at camp, I went up there and spent probably the majority of free time like lying on my bed, like just crying. Cause I was like, what just happened to my week? And I, you know, this was actually my first time being away from home. Like I was a homebody. I did not like going away to camp or to anywhere away from my family. And so this independent experience was extremely new to me. And even though I had like four or five of my best friends like that I would have throughout all of high school were with me in that cabin, I still, I felt this desire just to go home. I was like, this isn't worth it. I'm having a horrible time. But something, and I think it was God rose up in me that just said, you know what? Stick around, stay, see what happens. And not only did I become more, you know, close friends with the guys in my cabin, but later that week is when I really felt God calling me and saying, I have set you apart for ministry. This is what I want you to do with your life, which was not something I wanted to do at all. I wanted to be a professional basketball player. <laughs> yeah, I have a few problems with that. That's another story. So I, and so I'm glad I stuck around, but for many of us, this is like what we're going to think about when we hear the word promise, that people make promises and they break them. Promises to us are really it's like we can feel like they're really fluid and some of you might have a, a life situation or a person that a, I would say a damaging person in your life that was a serial promise breaker that just constantly would make these promises and say they were going to do these things and then not follow through and not do them. They might be a person that broke a promise for you up to 50, 100 times in your life. And so for many of us, hearing this word promise is going to be difficult for us to hear. But what I want to talk about this morning is that when we are children of God, like we talked about last week, we have been brought into God's family. We have been adopted into his family because of what Jesus did. That when we, when we are adopted into that family, there are promises that God has for us that are certain and sure. That you can take your money to the bank on them. That they are going to happen because God is the one who said, 
I am going to do these things. So this morning, we're going to talk about three promises of God that he gives when we become his children. And so let's go ahead and look at Galatians 4. We're going to be starting in verse 17. We're going to look at piece by piece. So let's look at this together. Verse 17, those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you may have zeal for them. It is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so always, not just when I am with you. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. How I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. Throughout this letter, Paul has been criticizing the Galatians and kind of, kind of being harsh on them in a way that he's, it's, it's a loving thing. He's trying to remind them of what he had taught them. See, he had come and taught them about the free grace gospel that Jesus offers, that by him dying on the cross and we giving our lives to him, we are then saved. And it's only because of that, or only having faith in that. That's the only reason that we are saved. But then these people came in called the Judaizers. And if you've been with us for the last few weeks, you've probably heard a lot about them, about these Judaizers. But if you haven't, let me give you a quick um, recap of what these people were like. The Judaizers were people that came in after Paul preached the gospel. And what they did is they would say, okay, you know, you are Gentiles. You know, people from Galatia were not Jewish, and so they were Gentiles. They say, you guys are Gentiles. Now that you have accepted Christ, in order to be fully part of the people of God, you, you need to be circumcised. You need to follow the food and dietary laws. You need to do these certain things. And when Paul heard about this, he got mad because this is not what the gospel is all about. The gospel has no law attached to it. It is not about you trying to muster your own righteousness up to God that somehow he would be pleased with you, that you can just make yourself righteous before him by your actions. Paul is continually talking about this in this book, that this is not the way that God has designed the gospel. And so when you look at this passage and he says those people, that's who he's referring to. He's referring to the Judaizers who were coming in. And he tells them, their, he tells the Galatians their motivations. Their motivations are to win you over, but for no good. He wants, so they, what they want, the Judaizers wanted was to take the Galatians and put them in their camp, their way of thinking, their system. And then the, look at what else Paul says. They, they wanted to alienate the people of Galatia away from Paul. Paul had visited Galatia and spent a lot of time there and that people were being impacted and were being shown the gospel and coming to know Christ. And what he's saying is he wants, these Judaizers want to alienate you. They want to separate you from this church that you have become a part of so that you had to have zeal for them, that you would have a passion for them. And then he says this phrase about it's fine to be zealous. It's fine to have passions. It's fine to have things that you are excited about. But he says you, they've got to be for the, exact, the, the, for the right reasons and to have that be the case always. And notice what he says, not just when I am with you. And that for us, we can look at that as kind of a, a, a quick application of that for Christians, it's not just about being passionate for Christ on Sundays, but being passionate for Jesus every single day of the week. That Christianity is a lifestyle thing. It's not just come on Sundays, worship God, go home, do whatever you want. It's Sundays is an expression of the rest of your week of how you have been living and worshiping God with your life. So then Paul says this very interesting phrase in verse 19, my dear children from whom I am again in the pains of childbirth, which we know is not physically possible for Paul to be able to feel that, having now been in the room and seen what the pains of childbirth are like, now that we have our two-month-old daughter, this is Paul's imagery of like saying, this is how much I long for you to understand this and that Jesus would grow in you. I have these deep pains within me that I want to see Christ formed in you. And he wants to see this because he, he's perplexed. He's saying, this is, this is not what the whole deal is about. I want to see Christ formed in you. And so we have to think about the Galatians and the way that they were working and kind of forgetting that, you know, that Christ is going to be forming himself in you anyway, even if you aren't able to follow the law perfectly. The law, again, was supposed to be, I've said this a, a few times over the last few weeks, and so if you haven't been here, let me refresh. The law 
is supposed to be, was supposed to be a revealer of sin. In no way was it supposed to be the blueprint by which if we followed it perfectly, we would be righteous before God. It was simply just to show, hey, guess what? You all have sin in your life and you need someone to save you. You need someone to act on your behalf. And that's what the law pointed to. And so the first promise that we're, we have, we're going to um, understand this morning is that, that, of God, that God gives us when we are a child, a child of God, that Christ will be formed in you. Uh, Cody, go ahead and go to the next slide, buddy. For the, this is our first promise, that Christ will be formed in you. And this, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is from Philippians 1, 6, and it says this, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. So the promise is, whether you die or Jesus comes back, that's the end point, and Jesus is going to be working in you throughout your entire life to bring you to maturity. That word when it's, he says to perfect you is to bring you to maturity, to form Christ in you more. So when you sacrifice yourself, you're, when you surrender yourself to Christ, this is the promise that Christ is going to be forming in you throughout your life. That God is not going to leave you to figure this out for yourself. That he's going to be working in you to make you more like him. And this is an amazing promise. But I got to tell you, it doesn't come through simple osmosis where it just kind of just like comes in when you give your life to Christ. It comes a lot of times through pain and through heartache and through suffering. But let me tell you, having been on the other side of having some hard things happen in my life, I look back and I just go, because of what God has done and how he, what has resulted in my life as a result of those things happening, it's been worth it. It's been worth it to have these things happen. Would I ever want those things to happen again? No. Not even close. I do not want those things to happen again. But at the same time, God has transformed me to be more like Christ as a result of these things. And so I am thankful. I am excited for what God is doing. And so when we look at this, this is the idea. This is the first promise that Christ is going to be working in you. He's going to be, he's not going to leave you to figure this out for yourself. He's going to be forming himself in you so that by the time either you pass away or Jesus Christ returns, you will look more like Christ then than you do today. And that's an amazing promise. And so Paul continues in his discussion in Galatians, and we're going to look at this little bit of a larger chunk, and it's an allegory. Paul is using uh, different elements of a story to represent something else. And so we're going to look at this as a chunk, like as just a big kind of like bird's eye view of this section. So let's look at verse 21 through 27. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as the result of a divine promise. These things are being taken figuratively. The women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free and she is our mother. For it is written, be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child. Shout for joy and cry aloud, you who are never in labor. Because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. And so Paul references this story in the New Testament. And for a Jew at this time, this story, this comparison that he makes, this allegory he makes would actually have been shocking. And so some of this is kind of shock value that Paul is really bringing this up to let them know this is how serious this is to try and elevate yourself by following the law. And so he tells a story about Abraham and his wife, Sarah, and then this woman named Hagar. Hagar was their slave. And so if we backtrack a little bit, early in Genesis, Abraham is promised by God that he is going to have a land that him and his offspring are going to live in and that he's going to have an offspring. 
At this time, his wife Sarah was barren, could not bear a child. And so Abraham, understandably, when he hears that God is saying, I am going to give you a child, is probably confused and perplexed and kind of going, are you serious? First of all, at this time, Abraham is 75 years old when he gets this promise. And actually, it says in the Bible that, they were adv- that he was advanced in age. So he was kind of getting past the point where children were a possibility. And so, so was his wife, who was also around that same age. But he gives him the promise, and he says, this is going to happen. And he reiterates that God reiterates this promise to Abraham several times until we get to Genesis chapter 16, where Abraham makes a mistake. You see, they're probably sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting. And up at this point, it's been years and years since God gave this promise. And so instead of continuing to wait on God to do what he said he was going to do, they decided to take matters into their own hands. And what they did is Sarah, and this was all Sarah's idea, but Abraham went with it. So they're both culpable for this. They are both equally responsible for what happened. Sarah gives her slave Hagar to Abraham to sleep with so that she could bear a child. And the idea was that they would then, Abraham and Sarah would raise this child as their own. And they named this son Ishmael. Now, this was not God's plan. This was not his promise. This is not what he had told them to do. And Abraham tries to make this work. He tries to tell God, God, I wish Ishmael would just live before you, that he would be the one that would be this divine promise. And God continues to tell him, that's not the one. It's, he's go- your son is going to come through Sarah, and that is it. This is going to be the divine promise because it has to be as a result of a miraculous work of God that this child of promise came only because it was God who did it. And there are many things that we look for in our lives that we want God to do, but oftentimes we want him to do it because we want him to bless kind of our own efforts and some of the things that we do and say, God, just, just, you know, I'm already doing this thing. Can you just kind of make it work, make it right? And God is saying, no, I've got my divine promises that I'm working on that I want to do. You got to let me do it. And as well, sometimes we try and even maybe justify our sin and we say, oh God, you know, just, just work with it. It's okay. Like, it's only a little bit like God doesn't allow for excuses for sin. Sin is sin. When we commit sin, it's on us. It's, uh, it's, it's our responsibility. And so Paul is making this extremely um, difficult comparison for us. Um, Cody, if you go to the next slide, we have a little table to kind of give you a, a picture of what he's, he's describing, and he's comparing the two women through this allegory. And so you have the son accord, born according to a fleshly act for Hagar, and then you have the son born according to a divine promise. And that he, what he's doing is he's taking Hagar and her son Ishmael, that this is a result of this, or comparing it to the law, following the law, and what it's actually going to do is it produces slaves, produces people who are going to be bound to it, that no matter how much uh, you are able to follow the law, that you are still not going to be able to measure up to the perfection that God requires. But Sarah represents this divine promise that God had said, it is only because of me that this is able to occur. And it's, and salvation truly, to be able to be saved in our relationship with God only comes because of what God has done. It can't possibly happen by anything that we do or else it's not good enough. It won't work. And so what he talks about is he, he makes this comparison between the two cities, this, these of Jerusalem and Jerusalem is one city. But he's talking about present Jerusalem. So the present mindset of Jerusalem that the law, following that law means you're going to be right before God and that everything will be um, good with God. Whereas what he, when he says the Jerusalem above, he's talking about this future hope of what Christianity is leading up to. You see, I think for many of us, especially for me, I grew up in church, heaven sounded kind of weird when I grew up in church, okay? Like, the way I always envisioned heaven was that we would all be, like, floating on clouds, um, wearing togas and sandals, um, and eating Philadelphia cream cheese, 
And I say that because, only because of the commercial, not because I think Philadelphia cream cheese is that delicious. Just, it's just the commercial, okay? And so that's what I think of is, is this idea. And if we think of heaven that way, that's boring. I don't want to do that. That, does, that sounds awful. But what heaven is described as in the Bible is this idea of like the culmination of everything that God has been building up for all of eternity. It's a restoration of what he intended life to be all about. It's a restoration of being taken back to the Garden of Eden, a perfect life with a perfect God in a perfect relationship with him. No more sorrow, no more, no more tears, no more pain, no more diseases, no more natural disasters. All of that is done with. And there will be no more sin to block us in our relationship with God and we'll be able to see him face to face. So heaven really is going to be this long-term hangout with Jesus for eternity. Seeing him face to face, worshiping him. And so this life now, we experience glimpses. Tiny little glimpses of what heaven is going to be like. One of my favorite things that we do at Camp Tapawingo is worship, is the music. Um, and we, seeing the kids worship God is one of the greatest things for me when, at camp every year. And by the end of the week, as we've been hearing from a speaker and hearing about how awesome God is, we start to worship. And in those moments, we get a glimpse of what heaven is supposed to be like, this worship of God. And that's the same thing. When we come here on Sunday mornings to sing songs, it's not just to stand in front of your seat and sing a song because the melody is pretty and the music is great. That, that's not why we do it. We do it because we are expressing our love and gratitude and thankfulness to God for who he is and what he has done. And we're entering in and it's a glimpse. It's a glimpse into what heaven will be like. And it's this hope. You know, we think of, a lot of times we'll think of hope as kind of this, I don't know, fluid kind of thing. It doesn't really, you know, it's kind of wishful thinking like, I hope to buy a house in five years. Or I hope my child someday becomes the next Michael Phelps. I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> but hey, you know, who knows? But we look at it, it's kind of like a wish. You know, I wish upon a star, you know, or take one of those plants and blow it and blow, have a wish. Like, we just wish this is going to happen. In terms of the Bible, hope is something that is for certain and sure that we know is going to happen. And that influences the way that we think about life, the way that we feel about our current circumstances. That even though things are hard right now, we know that someday we will reach heaven and it will be over that God is with us, that God is working in our lives to get us to that place. So our second promise that God gives to us is that, is that the hope of Christ is certain. Your hope in Christ will be fulfilled. That's what this is all, that the, this section is, is letting us know about. Your hope in Christ that you have been that you have been staking your life upon by putting your faith in Christ, this hope is going to be fulfilled. God will carry it to completion because that's what he does. And so this, so this is the promise. This life is not all there is. And so, but we have to remember this allegory that he's doing, that he's giving us. He's basically saying, if you live in this mindset that you can make yourself right before God, what you're actually doing is you're making yourself a slave to that very thing, which you'll never be able to reach. You'll never be able to reach that level of perfection because nobody's perfect. Nobody is, and that's the beauty of it. But if you give your life to Christ, if you put yourself upon him and you surrender your life to him, there is a freedom and there is a hope that God is building in our lives that someday this life will be over and we will be in eternity with him forever. Doesn't that sound amazing? Come on, come on. Yes, tell me. I need, sometimes I need the feedback because I need, you know, the, the validation that you're hearing, okay? But thank you. Yes, and so God is working. God has not left you and your, the hope is certain. So we're going to look at one more promise. Let's look at verse 28. Now you brothers and sisters like Isaac are children of promise. 
At that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the spirit. It is the same now. But what does scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. And so like Isaac, the son that was born to Abraham and Sarah that had been promised to them for nearly 25 years where they were well beyond the age of being able to bear children and Sarah was barren and couldn't have children anyway, this was the divine promise and that we are entered into that same promise. We are children of promise. That God has orchestrated this faith together so that we could enter into the promise of God that we could be a part of his family for forever. But then he talks, Paul talks about the fact that in references as part of the story, and this happens in Genesis 21, where Ishmael and Isaac are actually being, are growing up together. And you can imagine the animosity that could happen between those two, okay? And eventually Ishmael being the older one starts to pick on and persecute Isaac, and eventually, Sarah, with her mama radar going crazy, sees that her son's getting picked on, and she says, I want that woman and her son out of here. And, and so that's what happens. They send him out. And just so you know, there's a, a great story in the scriptures where God says to Hagar, I'm going to take care of you. Don't worry, I will provide for you. Your son's going to be a great nation, all that. So Hagar was taken care of. And God had told Abraham, you know what? Listen to your wife, Sarah. She's right. This is the divine promise. This is what I have in store. Your son, Isaac, is the one who gets to, be, uh, gets to take on the inheritance of your family. And so when Paul references this scripture, look at, he says, verse 30, but what does scripture say? That next phrase, get rid of the slave woman and her son, is actually a quote from Sarah in Genesis chapter 21 that Paul tweaks a little bit to his purposes. Talking about the fact that, you know, what needs to happen is the, you know, the, the slave son, the son that was not part of the promise needs to be removed and set out. And for us as Christians, what is a highly, um, highly marked precedent in our faith is this idea that we need to constantly be removing things that cause us to stumble, that persecute us, that try and tear us down. And what I'm talking about particularly are temptations and sin. And sin wouldn't be so tempting if it didn't look so good. Like for me, you know, and I'm using this as a silly example, um, not saying that eating chocolate cake is a sin, but I love chocolate cake. I don't need to be eating it all the time. That's a really bad idea. It sounds amazing, but it's still a bad idea, okay? Don't, and, and so, but it looks so good. I see the chocolate cake and I'm like, I want to eat that. That looks so good. But I just had a piece earlier. Move on. But there's, there's this precedent within scripture. And I, wanna, I want you to hear a couple passages that that say this in the New Testament. The book of Hebrews says to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. So if there's anything that hinders you from your relationship with Christ that could hinder your freedom in Christ, it's got to go. You got to get rid of it. Jesus goes so far to say in uh, Matthew, Matthew 5, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Now, if this was literal, none of us would have eyes in this room, okay? Every, let's be real. Every single one of us has sinned with our eyes before, okay? What Jesus is meaning is he's saying if there's something in your life that's causing you to stumble, causing you to sin, you got to get rid of it. You got to cut it out, whether it's your computer, your smartphone, your tablet, okay? A relationship with a person that you know is, um, is a stumbling block for you, okay? A place that you visit, something like that, something that is something you can cut out. And what he says is it's better for you to lose that thing, that tiny little thing, than for you to, tr to go into hell. I mean, that's how serious Jesus is about this idea. And so this is the third promise. This is right here is that as Christians, what we can know is that because of what Christ has done, that 
Christ will set you free from your slavery to sin. Many of us hear this idea that we need to cast off sin from our lives and we start to go, but I can't. I don't know how to do that. How do I do that? We have the desire and that's great. That's a great starting place that you have the desire, first of all. But the next thing is to remember, and it's this promise that like we talked about before, Christ is forming in you and that the hope of Christ is certain that it's going to be fulfilled. That throughout your life, you're going to find that Christ is going to be working in your life to remove the things that bind you, that hold you down. And sometimes that takes obedience. Sometimes that means I've got to cut this thing out of my life. I've got to remove it because it's not helping me. And we're even, and this could even be something that's, you know, morally neutral, you know, where it's not necessarily that you're doing anything morally wrong, you know, and the way I think of it is binge watching Netflix, okay? Or spending way too much time sitting in front of the TV watching sports, which is, that's my vice because I love sports. Um, and so something along those lines that could numb you and make you less sensitive to the heart of God. Anything, anything, the Bible's very clear, anything that hinders you and tangles you, throw it off. Why? Because Jesus is so worth it. Jesus is beyond worth it. Once we get to heaven, we're going to realize how silly it was for us to be bound and so tied up emotionally to these things. We're going to see how silly it was. It's like, this is God. This is who he is. How amazing is he? He's perfect, but yet he has this incredible love for us. And so we're going to see how silly this was. And again, the whole thing about heaven that we talked about earlier is that it's the culmination of what God has been working to. And so we will be set free, fully set free from sin. Sin will be bound and destroyed and we won't have, they won't have to deal with that anymore. But that doesn't mean that in this life, God won't work in you to set you free. Let me tell you about, you know, my life. I look back at my life and I see things that I was struggling with and, and addicted to, you know, 10, 15 years ago that now are not even an issue anymore because Christ worked, because Christ changed my heart. And I've heard stories and you've heard stories within this church of people just caught up in addictions who, and felt like there was no way out, who are now free and have not dealt with those for a long time. This is, the, this is the hope of Christianity. Christianity is not just this thing that you, you know, you come to this building once a week to sing some songs and hear about, you know, hear from some dude talking from the Bible, okay? What you come here for is to hear about this God who loved you, gave himself up for you, and wants to set you free that each of us can celebrate with each other on how God is working in each of our lives. So I want us to close and think of, uh, think of this thought. The fact that Christianity is this idea that we are to be set free. We are to be growing in our relationship with Christ and Christ is being formed in us. And I think one of the things that we always can be striving to get better at, always be working hard to get better at, is the fact that each person in this room and each person in this church is at a different point in that journey of how much Christ has been formed in them. None of us are supposed to be at, you know, the level of each other. Like each of us are at a different place and God is working. And so the point of what we need to be doing as a church is to show grace and compassion and love and encouragement, encouraging people, hey, move past that sin in your life. There's better things in store for you. God has greater things in, for your life than that sin or that relationship, okay, or that job. God has bigger things in store. Trust him. So we encourage one another. We love one another. We show grace to one another. The, whole, the point of the church is to be a place where people find grace and love compassion so that they can become more like Christ. That's what we need to be. That's what we need to be doing. And so that's acting on the promises of God. And so I want us to remember again that these promises that God has, has set out, these things are certain. When God makes a promise, he's going to do it. This is what he's going to be fulfilled. So I just want to encourage you as, as hard as it is 
to work hard at not allowing fear and anxiety and doubt to come into your mind. And when those things come, the Bible actually says to cast your cares upon God because he cares for you. It's in, it's in one of the Peter books. Give, give your heart. Talk to him and tell him, God, this is how I'm feeling. I doubt that this is going to happen. God, help me. Help me to, to know what it is you want for me and how you want to work. The whole point of the church is not to be this place that's a social club, okay, or a duty that we fulfill, but it's gathering as we work together to love on each other, to show the love of Christ and to remember his promises of what he is going to be doing and what he is doing in our lives. Let's, let's pray. God, we just thank you so much for this morning and God, that we can be reminded of your promises that you are certain, you are sure that you have come and you have fulfilled promises. And God, that we know the amazing thing is that you have already fulfilled promises that you were going, that, um, that you said you were going to do. You sent Jesus Christ to die on our behalf. God, you promised that was going to happen and it did. So God, we know that if you did that, how much more so will you do other things in our lives to take care of, to, to bring us closer to you, to show us the hope that we have in you. And so God, we just thank you for this morning as we continue our service. God, we want to be honoring you with everything that we do. We pray this in your name. Amen. We're going to go into a time of prayer and healing. And so if there are ailments that you are dealing with, um, we're going to have uh, people stationed at different spots to be praying for you. Um, Sam, I have you, I have you as one of the people at prayer station. So Sam Rich will be back there. Um, and we just invite you, you know, during this next song, Chuck's just going to be playing to reflect on what God has, has said. And if you are really in need of prayer, um, come back, find Sam. Uh, I'll sit over here at this table and, or at these chairs. And if you need prayer, you know, we, would, we invite you to come. Book of James says that if the elders are in need of prayer, to come and, and to come and ask the elders for healing and for prayer. And so that's what we're doing. We're, we're acting out in obedience here, and so we would love for you to do that. So let me pray for us as we go to this, this time. God, thank you so much for the fact that you, that you want to heal our hearts and heal our souls. And God, we want to ask in faith for you to heal um, any physical ailments or, or spiritual ailments that we are going through. God, we just desire for you to, to be working in and among us. So God, we just thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.